Good evening. Welcome you all to sixth webinar hosting by Civil Department Association, Force of College of Engineering, Patanaburam. Kindly raise your doubts regarding the topic in YouTube comment session and be with sir and he will clarify it at the end of the session. I am glad to introduce lecturer of this webinar, Professor Dr. G. Madhu. Let me give a about sir. He is Professor and Head of Safety and Fire Engineering Department in KUSAT. He completed his B.Tech in Chemical Engineering from Government Engineering Thrissur and M.Tech in Chemical Engineering with Environmental Engineering Specialization from IIT Madras. Obtained PhD from Environmental Engineering from He received many awards for his work including Young Scientist Award for Ecology and Environment instituted by State Committee of Science, Technology and Environment of Kerala. He also supervised more than 90 MTech dissertation and MPhil dissertation. He published his 90 paper in international journals. He has presented 70 papers in international or national conference. He served as the chairman Ernakulam District Environment Committee constituted by Kerala State Pollution Control Board during 2006-2012. Let me welcome you sir to this webinar. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, good, evening. Uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, shall I start? Okay, good evening thank to you. all of you. Uh, at the outset, uh, let me thank the uh, Department of uh, Civil Engineering, uh, College of Engineering, Patanapuram, for uh, inviting me to this uh, webinar. I understand that uh, you are regularly holding uh, webinars on uh, uh, topics of interest to uh, civil engineers and uh, engineers from other areas. So the topic of uh, my uh, presentation is uh, environmental impact assessment. Uh, you might have uh, heard of this term. Uh, it is uh, uh, commonly called EIA. In short, it's called uh, EIA. And uh, you may be aware that uh, EIA has been made mandatory for all the most of the developmental projects, the developmental projects uh, in our country, whether it's a, a road project or whether it's a harbor project or a chemical industry project or whether it's a uh, uh, airport uh, construction project, whatever it be, uh, you have to conduct an environmental impact assessment and uh, obtain environmental clearance from the concerned authorities. That's the importance of uh, environmental impact assessment. Now let's uh, examine the, uh, the evolution of uh, environmental impact assessment. You know that there has been a conflict between development and uh, environment. Uh, this conflict uh, started right from the days of the industrial revolution, when uh, men uh, started uh, Construction, constructing industries, and also he went for uh, various types of developmental projects. So in earlier days, uh, little uh, importance was given to environmental protection. Development was the only goal. And at that time, uh, we used to conduct only a profit analysis of developmental project. Uh, profit was the main body. What's the benefit, financial benefit out of the project? That was the concern in those days. You know that this conflict led to a lot of uh, problems in the environment. It led to the degradation of the environment. It led to a uh, lot of pollution problems. You may be aware that uh, uh, even in the developed, developed countries, uh, the developed countries faced the uh, air pollution problems, water pollution problems, as well as soil pollution problems in the right from the 1930s to the 1960s. So when there were uh, several environmental disasters in those developed countries, they started thinking about protecting the environment. They came to the conclusion that development should be taken up only with the protection of the There was a uh, feeling that environment and uh, development should uh, go hand in hand. So incidentally, in the United Kingdom, they adopted a, a legislation called uh, the National Environmental Policy Act. It is uh, referred to as uh, NEPA, which was uh, adopted in the year 1969. Uh, this uh, legislation is usually referred to as 
the Magna Carta for Environment in the United States. This particular legislation paved the way for the development of procedures and methodologies for EIA. So that was the first attempt in the world to develop procedures and methodologies for conducting an environmental impact assessment. Now, some of you may be aware of this particular uh, event. It was a landmark uh, event as, well, as far as uh, environmental protection is concerned. It was a UN conference. This, this UN conference on human environment, it was held at uh, Stockholm. Stockholm is the capital of Sweden. It was held in June 1972 to share the global concern for environmental protection. So the purpose of this UN was to devise ways and means to ensure environmental protection around the globe, whether it's a, a developed country or a developing country. Then this particular conference was uh, attended by representatives from uh, almost 100 countries. Our country was also represented at the meeting, at this particular conference. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, our Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, uh, she was the it to attend this conference. So she gave a lot of importance to this aspect and she herself attended the conference which lasted for almost a week. And at the end of the conference, uh, the had these uh, representatives of different countries an action plan related to various aspects related to human life like uh, human settlements and human health terrestrial ecosystems that is land ecosystems environment and oceans energy and natural disasters so it was a uh, very comprehensive uh, revolution and uh, this conference called upon the world nations to adopt method of protecting the environment. And uh, even uh, the conference insisted that uh, every country should go for environment because uh, legislations, the enforcement of legislations can go a long way in ensuring protection of the environment. For example, for preventing pollution, enforcement of laws, it is very important. You know that uh, in our country we have uh, the so-called pollution control boards. We have this central pollution control board uh, at the center and uh, the state pollution control boards at the state level. And uh, just after two years, uh, this conference was held in 1970. And uh, just after two years, that was that is in 1974, we first formal environmental legislation. This particular legislation was called the water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act, uh, 1974. In fact, uh, this act paved the way for the formation of the, uh, the central and control boards, which, which, which are supposed to implement this particular legislation. And uh, afterwards, a number of legislations were uh, passed by the parliament, like the uh, Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act. Then after the Bhopal disaster, uh, and environment was also adopted. So all these uh, legislations uh, were framed in order to protect the end. Now, when we consider the term environment, everyone, uh, all of you are familiar with this term. Uh, environment is in fact a combination of our natural and physical surroundings. It's a combination of the nature, natural as well as physical surroundings and also it considers the relationship of human beings with its uh, aesthetic, historic, cultural, economic and social aspects. And also it can be considered as a sum total of physical factors are called abiotic factors like uh, uh, abiotic factors like soil, temperature, rain, uh, all these things are abiotic factors. Then several biotic conditions like the uh, flora, animals, then the human beings, they are all part of the biotic conditions influencing the responses of the organism. So that way the term environment can be defined. Now uh, the term environment, it is characterized by many attributes. 
uh, you know that uh, environment consists of air water land then the ecology ecology means uh, the consisting of plants and animals the noise human beings meteorology meteorology is the study of uh, climatic conditions solid base social factors economics resources all the different uh, attributes of the environment the last step resources you know that uh, we get all the resources from nature the forest resources the water resources the mineral resources the food resources they are all supported by the environmental factors now now coming to the theme in impact uh, because uh, we are uh, dealing with the topic environmental impact assessment impact is any change to the environment any change is considered as impact this impact need not be negative always it can be beneficial also because it has a negative connotation but uh, it's not so there can be beneficial impacts also from a project you get the beneficial impacts of uh, economic uh, improvement of the area economic improvement of the people in the area so that way beneficial impacts can also there but uh, most of the time adverse impacts will be more now we can uh, give a definition to environmental impact assessment it is defined like this it's a study of the changes in the socio economic because you we have because we know that uh, environment as a socio economic component and also the biophysical study of the changes in the socio economic and biophysical components of the environment which result from a proposed or impending action we usually carry out an eia study for a proposed action not for an ongoing activity but for a proposed or impending action it may be for a proposed hydroelectric project or for a proposed uh, airport project like that now this is a more formal question uh, for eia it was given by the canadian environmental assessment and research council uh, you can have a look at it it says which attempts to identify and predict the impacts so it has two objectives identification and prediction of impacts of so we try to identify and predict the impacts of it can be a legislative a policy a program a project or operational procedures all of them can be subjected to an eia study and so we consider the impact of all these proposed uh, uh, actions on the biophysical environment and on the human health and well-being so it is identification and prediction of impacts so and also we have to interpret and communicate the information because we get lot of information in this exercise of identification and prediction and we have to interpret properly interpret and communicate this uh, this information in order to devise methods for the management of adverse impacts so ultimately we uh, we have the impacts in the best possible manner maybe for, for example from project uh, uh, water pollution is a major problem what that project will result in water pollution issues so we have to put ways to manage that water pollution ultimately so all these identification and uh, the identified and predicted impact should be properly interpreted and communicated at the authorities as well as the, the authorities the public the common man everyone will understand uh, understands it and uh, they take uh, mitigating measures now we have uh, three major types of eia one is called a strategic environmental assessment then we have a project ea and a cumulative environmental assessment so this strategic environmental assessment 
it pertains to a policy plan or program and its alternative because in the formal definition of uh, eaa you have seen you can evaluate you can identify and the predict uh, identify and predict the impacts of a policy program plan and all that so the process of evaluating the environmental effects of a policy plan or program is called strategic eaa so it's a it's an exercise with a flexible time frame with a policy focus because this exercise is carried out at the highest level of the decision making authority highest level of the government because the policies and plans are formulated by the uh, for example in our country it is formulated by by the central cabinet or by the state cabinet so it has a policy focus uh, but anyway this strategic eaa very few countries have started doing this exercise the reason may be the lack of political will lack of commitment and lack of awareness needed to implement this strategic uh, environmental assessment so very few countries do that only countries like uh, canada new zealand they have adopted this strategic eaa program so the eaa is carried out at the uh, at the policy level now we have the project eaa in our country we focus only on project eaa it addresses specific individual projects as i told you earlier it may be a hydroelectric project or a uh, thermal power project or it can be a uh, what we call a air a new airport project or a express highway project we address a specific individual projects and try to address the internal and the near field impacts and again the project eaa has uh, certain characteristics this eaa addresses the impacts during two phases because developmental pro project has a construction phase as well as an operate that is after the completion of the project we will operate operate that particular entity so we have to address the impacts during construction phase and operation phase so we try to identify and the impacts so the project eas they have a defined time frame because the project anyway that uh, project has to be executed so the eaa study has to be completed within a uh, time frame then the uh, concerned authorities have to examine this eaa report then they should uh, decide whether that project can be cleared from the environmental angle or not so it should have a defined time frame so say for example it should be completed in say 6 months time or in one year time like that the third type of eaa is called a cumulative eaa cumulative eaa addresses the combined impacts of all projects in an area for a, more than one project is coming up in a particular area then you can address the combined impacts the cumulative impacts of all these projects in this particular exercise cumulative eaa and it addresses the near field and uh, far field impacts and uh, usually it is considered as a of the project eaa so we have three types of eaa strategic eaa project eaa and cumulative eaa and uh, in our country we focus on developmental eaa projects or uh, eaa for developmental projects now there are uh, certain uh, terms uh, which forms part of the eia terminology uh, like uh, screening scoping impact assessment eis and mitigation so we will examine them one by one screening screening determines the level of eia required so for example uh, again the screening process depend uh, depends on the legislative process in the country so the 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 existing legislation in a country for eia may be specified for what all type of projects this eia has to be carried out so based on that you can select select the the we can decide whether this particular project should undergo the eia process so it's a method of selection which allows elimination from the review process all those projects that do not require detailed eia for control so for example for minor projects 
EIM may not be required. For example, a small uh, quarry project. Now, it is very common in our country. Quarry projects are there. For example, a quarry project of, uh, say, less than uh, uh, five acres of uh, land area. They are all exempted from a formal study. Like so it avoids unnecessary expense and delays in process. Because if we carry out an EAA, it takes a, it's, it takes some time because it has a time frame of say uh, about uh, if we go for an EAA, EAA, that much of delay will be there. So that can be avoided if we carry out a proper screening based on the legislative requirements existing in that particular country. Then comes uh, scoping, as the term indicates. Uh, it's the process of significant issues. What are the significant issues to be addressed in the EAA? That's the purpose of scope. So it is based on uh, the criteria of magnitude, prevalence, frequency, and the duration of the environmental changes. Uh, because uh, the scoping is very important because uh, you cannot have uh, the same criteria for all the developmental projects. For example, uh, suppose you are carrying carrying out a EAA study for a uh, highway project. In the case of a highway project, during construction phase as well as phase, the main concern is uh, uh, degradation of the air environment. So the degradation of the water environment may not be of uh, much significance. So you can decide what type of weather we consider this operation uh, do, whether we should consider the impact on the water environment during the operation phase so such a criteria we can evolve uh, uh, can be evolved so that's part of scope then impact as we have seen in the definition impact assessment involves uh, three major components one is identification Second one is prediction, identification and prediction of impacts and also evaluation. The purpose of evaluation is to interpret and communicate and interpretation for interpreting the results from identification and prediction. We may require some magical tools, some numerical scales and all that. So an evaluation is done and evaluation is done on the magnitude and significance of the impacts. Anyway, we will uh, come to that later. Then, environmental impact statement or EIS in short. This EIS is a summary report. Finally, you have to prepare. After we complete the EIA exercise, we should be able to produce a summary report of the EIA and it is called EIS. Then comes mitigation. And uh, once we complete the EAA part, as we have seen earlier, we have to suggest management measures. That is, measures to reduce, eliminate, offset, or control adverse effects. What all measures are required? Uh, earlier, we discussed the case of uh, pollution problems, pollution problems from that particular project. So we should, you should be able to suggest how you will reduce or eliminate or control the effects of pollution. In some cases, it may be a rehabilitation of people. For example, in the case of a big dam project, a lot of areas will get uh, inundated. It will get immersed once the dam uh, is coming. So uh, people living in that area, large number of people living in that area may have to be rehabilitated. So you should have a mitigative plan. That mitigative plan is usually referred to as the Environment Program or EMP. Nowadays, we talk about EAA and EMP together. We uh, produce, we generally prepare a uh, report consisting of EAA and EMP. Both are uh, very important. Based on the EAA, you have to prepare a management plan or program. Now, we will examine the most important uh, characteristics of EAA. What are the salient features? These are the salient features. It uh, generally explores higher order impacts on the environment. Lower order impacts are generally not considered. Higher order impacts, impacts of uh, higher magnitude. Then intended to anticipate the uh, consequences of development. That's the purpose of EAA. We anticipate, we try to predict the consequences of development. 
it's uh, highly systematic a methodology has been evolved over the years and again it's a very comprehensive exercise and it's usually highly localized because we usually carry out uh, the project uh, uh, we carry out eas for projects so the project may be localized sometimes uh, for a, for uh, highway projects and all it may not be that localized but in the eea study we consider which is covered on both sides of the highway so that way it is localized then it has specific formats because the legislation does not prescribe any format but uh, a lot of over the years because you know that the eea is uh, almost uh, 50 years old it was it's uh, somewhere in the 19 early 1970s so it is almost 50 years old and uh, lot of uh, work has been done on the uh, developments and methodologies and it entails more primary data collection we focus on primary data collection with the components of the environment that we have seen like water air soil microorganisms etc then it considers environmental cause in addition to resource cause because that is also a new concept environmental cause earlier we used to consider only we used to conduct a uh, cost benefit analysis but the the modern trend is to evaluate the environmental cost of an activity because environmental degradation will lead to cost the the what we call uh, the authorities the uh, governing agency will have to incur various types of hidden costs due to environmental degradation that may result from a developmental action that's what uh, it considers environmental course now we will focus more on a project eia who are the participants in the project eia uh, usually we have uh, five or six one is the proponent then the public the decision maker then there is a review commission and the consultant. The proponent is the person or group of persons who wish to carry out a developmental activity. It may be a private uh, group, a private uh, company or a public limited company. That agency is the proponent. If it's a highway project, then maybe the, uh, the uh, public works department or the uh, roads just corporation they they may be the proponents so the pro proponent that was the group of persons who proposes the project then the decision maker the decision maker is the competent authority finally the project has to be cleared from the environmental angle by the decision maker it's the competent authority in our country the supreme decision making authority is the ministry of environment forests and climate change recently climate change was also added to their purview earlier it was just mof now it is moefc ministry of environment forests and climate change uh, and uh, and also at the state level because uh, in our country uh, the EIA process was formally adopted in the year 1994 uh, through a notification, which is part of the Environment Protection Act of 1986. And uh, in 2006, this particular notification was amended and uh, certain powers were delegated to the states and the states to, uh, state of, to formulate, to establish state level impact assessment authorities for uh, certain projects uh, the the decision making authority is given to the state level impact assessment authorities so at the state level also there is a competent authority now there is a review commission because this review committees or review commissions support the decision maker for example MOEF and C is supported by different appraisal committees. They are expert committees, expert groups. They will uh, go through the thoroughly examine the project, the thoroughly examine the year report and will uh, give their recommendation to the decision maker. Then based on that, the decision maker uh, will take a decision on whether 
to clear the project out. at the state level also the state impact assessment authority is supported by uh, state level uh, impact assessment uh, they are also uh, expert group so they will make recommendations so that is part of the uh, review commission then you have the uh, consultants usually consultants also play an important role because in our country the eia studies are carried out by the consultant will uh, ask they will uh, commission a proponent to carry out the consultant they will engage a consultant and uh, ask them to prepare the project ea it has some problems because uh, the consultant may be influenced by the uh, by the interests of the proponent that uh, a disadvantage is there but still a lot of uh, very uh, very eminent uh, consultants are there in our country for example uh, the one of the pioneers in our country as far as eia is concerned is the national environmental engineering research institute you may have uh, heard of this uh, premier csir laboratory it is uh, located in nagpur with uh, sonal laboratories in different states it's uh, called in neeri national environmental engineering research institute they were the first to carry out eia studies in our country way back in the they started the process way back in the 1980s and it continued after the uh, formal eia notification was issued in uh, 1994 and so many other private uh, and uh, uh, public limited uh, public and public limited consultant companies are there <coughs> now how let's examine the eia process the eia process it has uh, it has three main stages it has a pre study period then the assessment study period and also the post study period where whether the information is used and the recommendations are monitored then uh, this is the these are the steps involved in the pre study period the, there is a first appraisal followed by screening scoping and finally specific guidelines are for, formulated for the eia study that is pre study stage then then comes the study period these are the study period activities of project data then you have to collect dot, a lot of primary as well as secondary data pertaining to the environmental components the initial impacts then study program prediction and assessment prediction then first part you have the identification then prediction then that evaluation the interpretation and uh, communication of the results then comparison of alternatives and reporting but in our country we don't consider alternatives but in other countries they consider various alternatives for a developmental project example suppose you are going for a thermal power project so you can and uh, you you will have several alternatives before you for example it can be based on coal it can be a coal power project or it can be a power project based on uh, a petroleum fuel like the then or it can be based on a cleaner fuel like uh, the natural gas now natural gas is also available in plenty so suppose you have to consider all these alternatives then you will carry out the study for all these three alternatives and make a comparison and we will report which alternative has the least impact on the environment and finally eia study should result in an eis it is the environmental impact statement now uh, project data you have to collect lot of project data that we have seen already uh, the this data uh, concerns the activities the sources of mitigation plans what are the mitigation uh, plans or management plans considered in the project then data about other developments in, in the area data are reported then environmental data environmental data collection and because uh, here you have to focus more on the existing environment and we are trying to predict the impact of the project in this existing environment with the project so collection and analysis of the baseline data baseline data is data pertaining to the existing environment that is very important and you should we go for uh, a data we go for uh, uh, 
almost uh, three months data collection in the case of a rapid EA. A rapid EA, in, for most of the projects, a rapid EA is sufficient. Anyway, the data collection will last for about three months or in the in Western countries, they collect one season data because they have four seasons like autumn, spring, all those things, winter. So they collect data. So we also restrict uh, three months data collection. Generally, we avoid the monsoon season, the, uh, the summer season, because the impact of pollution and other aspects will be more in uh, the summer season. So the duration of data collection is about three months. It's a rapid EA. And if it lasts for three seasons or about an year, it is called a comprehensive EA. Usually, uh, we will have to carry out a rapid EA first. And the comprehensive EA will be carried out if the decision making authority insists on such an EA exercise. Now, what we have to consider uh, relevant alternatives, but anyway, it's not applicable in our country, relevant impacts. Relevant impacts means impacts relevant to that particular project. Earlier I explained, for a highway project, air, push, uh, air pollution is uh, more responsible for impacts. So like that, you have to consider, depending on the nature of the projects. So we have to thoroughly analyze the project. Then relevant criteria should be there again, the, the legislative criteria and uh, uh, such requirements. Then the study program. The study program involves prediction approach and additional data collection and analysis. Uh, for, predict, for, the, for the purpose of prediction, we usually use mathematical and numerical models. Then post-study stage, the EIA will be reviewed. Decision, the decision maker will uh, uh, communicate the decision. And then you can execute the project, execution and evaluation. Even after the Commission of the commissioning of that particular project, you can monitor, you can evaluate. And uh, EAA, this is done by the uh, by the review committees. They will examine EAA for completeness, scientific correctness. Uh, this uh, review committees uh, consist of uh, scientific experts in from different areas because EAA is an interdisciplinary exercise. Uh, it needs the involvement of uh, uh, life science uh, people experts from life sciences uh, geology then uh, atmospheric then uh, water resource engineering uh, then environmental engineering then even uh, economy sociology so it's a collective exercise all and also the review committees also uh, consist of uh, people from different disciplines so they will examine whether this EIA report has scientific correctness and where it's fit for decision making. Then decision, again, decision will uh, consider the mitigation measures. Then uh, as far as uh, what we call uh, uh, projects involving uh, uh, what we call discharge of uh, effluents and emissions, then there are uh, certain operating conditions or NOC yeah, issued by the state pollution control board that will be considered by the decision maker then public participation that is also an integral part of the eia process and again this given in the eia notification it was in the first notification of 1994 it was not there in our country in uh, uh, 1996 only it was added then a uh, participation now uh, public has to build their opinion and that opinion also will be there will be a, uh, what we call a public uh, presentation the project proponent will uh, interact with the public under the supervision of the district administration and the state pollution control board they have to address the concerns of the local people that is public participation then the views of the public also will be communicated to the decision maker if the public is vehemently opposing the project, maybe usually uh, the opposition may be due to various factors, but they will uh, take into account whether take into account the genuineness of this uh, public uh, opposition and take a decision. Then integral evaluation, monitoring requirement, all those things will be uh, spelt out in the decision process, uh, process decision making process. Then uh, execution, as we have said earlier. 
we have to consider the construction phase and the operational phase of the project and uh, we have to monitor the impacts during execution for example if it's a highway project then you have to monitor the air quality during construction and also operation construction phase also a lot of uh, dust and fumes will uh, uh, escape from the site so we have to monitor the uh, the ambient air to ensure to to ensure that the air quality uh, does not uh, get deteriorated that is important during operational phase also then an evaluation also will be done because in the eis prediction prediction a prediction may be related to uh, say for example pollution air pollution then you will consider the actual situation. You anyway, predicted value. It is based on uh, what we call scientific methods. So we will compare the actually monitored results with the predicted results. And uh, if and if there is wide variation, then you have to initiate corrective additional uh, mitigating measures. Now, uh, earlier we have seen that. Uh, we have to collect uh, baseline data, that is data uh, with respect to the existing environment. So that uh, data collection uh, methodology is called the uh, base information approach. So these are the type of data that we collect uh, with respect to the present environment, physical environment, uh, topography, climate, air, water, soil, then the ecological environment, vegetation, wildlife, aquatic life, then the land use, agriculture, forestry, etc. Data regarding the human settlements, roads, and the social structure like the demography, health, employment, and also the institutional structure, including the public administration. All this data will have to be collected. Then uh, project data also, we have already seen project data. The data uh, related to the project should be collected. Uh, for every project, there will be a detailed uh, project report. That project to re project report will contain uh, all this data. That data also should be considered. Then uh, alternative projects. Anyway, it's not applicable in our country. If it is required, alternative projects are native locations, alternative technology, etc. Then identification of impacts. So that's the first step in the EIA process. Identification, identification uh, is followed by prediction, then evaluation of impacts, then preparation of e, then preparation of the EMP. So identification uh, for the baseline data collection is followed by identification of impacts. Environments uh, include effects on various components of the environment and effect on public health cost of environmental management, all this has been identified. Then uh, impact identification is usually done with the help of a cause, condition, it will. For uh, you know that for every effect, there is a cause and certain conditions are also there. So we evolve a cause, condition, effect network for the various activities to identify the impacts. So, it uh, identification, impact identification and in, uh, enables selection of the parameters for baseline data collection. That is also, clearly you can do that. So, it will uh, enable the selection of parameters for baseline data collection. Then, uh, then comes prediction. Prediction of impacts. Because we are carrying out the EAA study for a proposed activity. So, we don't we do not know we don't have a physical model of the project before us so we have to project environmental setting into the future with and without the project even without the project there can be changes in the existing environment and with the project that changes will be more significant and uh, then we perform necessary calculations for predicting the real impacts of the proposed project uh, for impact prediction, uh, mathematical models are very commonly used. And uh, you know that the real life application of these models is a complex process because uh, all the models may not uh, suit uh, our requirements. 
so the models need to be modified to suit the situation uh, a number of mathematical models are available or available uh, for example we have mechanistic or uh, mathematical models mass models statistical models physical image models field and laboratory experimental method analog models various types of models are available for impact prediction for example anyway uh, we don't have time to discuss all the models we will discuss uh, salient features of these uh, models available for impact prediction for example mathematical models they describe uh, cause effect relationship in the in the form of uh, flow charts or mathematical functions uh, and uh, we have deterministic models as well as uh, stochastic models uh, deterministic models depend on fixed relationships stochastic way are uh, probabilistic in nature then you have mass balance models development of mass balance equations establishing mass balance equation for a given compartment for example for a given volume or for a given area uh, then statistical models statistical techniques such as regression or principal component analysis to find out the relationship between data and also it can be used for testing hypothesis or for extrapolating data an example is uh, given here for example uh, to describe the concentration of pollutant as a function of the stream flow rates and uh, the distance downstream a statistical model can be used then physical image models like the computer graphics they can be effectively used then field and laboratory experimental method one example is testing of a pesticide in an outdoor pool that can be done as part of the uh, exercise then analog models uh, based on analogous situations then uh, now usually you uh, we have uh, seen that you have to consider different components of the environment uh, most of the project will have some effect on that uh, to predict the effect on the atmosphere we have uh, and the predictive techniques for uh, uh, source models then if the then for uh, then uh, effects on air quality these models are very popular some of you might have uh, uh, studied about uh, the gaussian plume dispersion, uh, dispersion model for uh, air quality prediction it's a very useful model usually it is made use of in uh, eas studies nowadays uh, well developed uh, Uh, commercial softwares are also available for uh, doing this uh, uh, predictive uh, prediction calculations uh, based on this they are the software developed based on gaussian plume dispersion model then for predictive techniques for aquatic if we have water quality models water quality models for rivers estuaries etc dissolved oxygen models are very popular uh, those who have studied environmental engineering should be knowing this the very popular uh, uh, do sac model dissolved oxygen sac model and all that and uh, finally you uh, you can make use of this uh, uh, streeter phelps equation for predicting the dissolved oxygen in a stream uh, at uh, different distances from the source of discharge the subsurface effects we consider uh, hydraulic effects effects on groundwater quality in all these uh, for each and every effect uh, there are uh, useful models then effects on plants and animals mathematical models survey techniques then effects on landscape 2d 3d models acoustic effects like uh, noise effects uh, ambient sound and noise models are there then uh, this is the very popular uh, gaussian plume dispersion model for stack emission some of you might have uh, uh, studied this Uh, equation this is the standard uh, equation you calculate the ground level concentration of a pollutant emitted from a chimney usually in industries uh, uh, stacks uh, uh, emitting different uh, different types of uh, pollutants will be there so we are more concerned about the ground level concentration at a stack so we consider the so called effective height of stack effective height of stack is the uh, sum of the physical height 
and the plume rise. Plume rise is represented as delta h. To calculate delta h, we have empirical equations. You can make use of that. And all these, as you usually go for a plume center line concentration of the pollutant. It may, for example, it may be sulfur dioxide uh, emitted from a stack in a project. So you can calculate the ground level concentration. And you can compare the ground level concentration with the permissible ambient air quality. Every country has uh, ambient air standards. Our country also has a uh, ambient air quality standard. We call it National Ambient Air Quality Standards, uh, formulated by the Central Pollution Control. So you can compare the uh, predicted ground level concentration with that standard. And if it is uh, more than the standard, you can think of increasing the height of the stack. Or you can even think of uh, installing uh, uh, more effective pollution control measures in your plant. Those things are possible. Then Gaussian plume model, uh, it makes several some, you know, water quality models, the mixing zone model and the dissolved oxygen model. Dissolved oxygen model is uh, known to many of you. You consider the deoxygenation, reoxygenation, deoxygenation and reoxygenation in the water body. Deoxygenation is uh, usually uh, uh, takes place uh, due to the discharge of uh, uh, organic waste. Organic waste water will lead to uh, the deficit of or depletion of dissolved oxygen in water. That aspect is considered in the very popular. It's almost uh, uh, 95 years old, this Treter Phelps equation. Still, it is used uh, uh, very effectively in uh, uh, this uh, EIA studies. There are uh, standard uh, commercial softwares based on this dissolved oxygen more than uh, there are indices, environmental indices, as far as uh, the uh, various environmental components. They can also be made use of. This is about biological indices, diversity. We talk about the diversity of uh, various living organisms in, a, in an environment. For example, diversity of plankton in the water environment. It's an index of pollution. If the diversity comes down, then it's an indication that that uh, water is uh, uh, not suitable for supporting life. So such indices are uh, taken into account. And uh, incidentally, uh, we are observing the world uh, environment day tomorrow. Uh, you know that uh, world environment day is observed on uh, every year. And uh, this world environment day had its uh, origin in the 1972 conference. In the beginning, I explained to you about uh, the UN conference that uh, that had taken place in uh, uh, Sweden, in Stockholm in 1972. And uh, this conference uh, decided to have a UN, uh, uh, a UN organization exclusively for environmental protection. That agency is called the UNEP, United Nations Environment Program. And uh, the final resolution of the Stockholm conference was adopted on 5th of June 1972. And to commemorate that equation, that uh, occasion, World Environment uh, 5th of June every year. And tomorrow we are observing this year's World Environment Day. And, and the theme for uh, World Environment Day 2020 is biodiversity. Because biodiversity has a lot of significance. Here we are plankton in the water environment. So as far as uh, our environment is concerned, the diversity of living beings is very important for uh, because biodiversity has benefits and values because it supports uh, our ecosystem. It supports uh, various uh, resources. And then it supports it. It has an aesthetic value. Then it has uh, a moral and uh, ethical value. So there is a need to conserve the biodiversity because uh, you know that uh, human beings, human beings, uh, we are uh, uh, more selfish. We try to kill uh, a kill a, uh, the entire population of a species. Sometimes it becomes extinct because of the selfish actions of the human race. So now we are slowly understanding importance of conserving the biodiversity so that way incidentally i have uh, 
indicated the importance of uh, this particular concept of biodiversity. So all of these aspects are considered in prediction. Then, as part of the EAA, we usually consider a conduct a social impact assessment also in the social consequences because we have to consider the social consequences that are likely to follow from the project development. It can be from a policy also. So social impacts include all social and cultural consequences to human populations. So we consider all these things and safety, the impact on health and safety, impact on economy, cultural and urban resources, aesthetic characteristics, regional growth and infrastructure, population characteristics. So these are all part of the exercise. Economy, usually employment, housing, commerce, cost of living. Because uh, as far as employment is concerned, every developmental project has, they, it has a uh, positive impact. It is a, it's a positive, beneficial impact. Then uh, cultural and urban resources, because sometimes a project uh, may affect the uh, the belief systems of the area, if people have to be rehabilitated, then their belief systems may get impacted. Then uh, recreational, historical, sometimes uh, some of the historical and archaeological resources may get impacted due to a proposed project. That those aspects we have to consider. Aesthetic characteristics, regional growth and uh, infrastructure, population characteristics, the so-called demography. It is to be considered. So there are several methods to assess the impact. now in the okay. So now, uh, so we have talked about impact identification and impact prediction. The third stage or the third step in the is assessment of predicted impact. The basic objective of the assessment is to provide a structure within which all the information on the environmental impacts, the identified and predicted impacts of a proposed activity, it is to be organized, it can be organized, evaluated, analyzed and presented in a suitable form, in a form suitable for the decision maker as well as interested parties. That's the basic objective of this evaluation or assessment which is the third step in the EAA process. Assessment, uh, usually several methods are available. The most commonly used method involves numerical rating and ranking or a weighting and scaling of various impacts. The weighting and scaling method is, uh, uh, it is preferable uh, because of the reason that the weighted scores can be equated to yield an aggregate score representing the net environmental impact of a particular alternative. Thus, you get a numerical score. Then it will be easier to assess the impact. When different alternatives are there, it will be easier to compare the impacts of these alternatives. These are the methodologies used for the assessment. Last 50 years, number of uh, methodologies have been developed. Uh, we have the ad hoc procedure, the simplest of all the methodologies, the overlay techniques, checklists, matrices, networks, simulation models. And uh, these methodologies have been developed to serve uh, one particular function. It may be developed, it might have been developed for uh, one uh, particular type of a specific uh, type of project. But those techniques have uh, been extended to other areas also. And also, these techniques can be used for identification of impacts also. Not only really they are useful, not only really for assessment, but for identification also. So, yeah, it's a simple thing. A team of experts will sit together and try to identify impacts in this area, in their areas of expertise. It's, the, it's a crude method, such as broad areas of possible impacts. The major disadvantage is that it is highly fragmented. That's the problem. Then the overlay technique. Overlay technique it depends on a set of maps. In the big, in the in earlier days, it was developed uh, during the 1970. I think it was developed in the year 1976. It depended on a set of maps of environmental characteristics. A map for uh, uh, physical characteristic, map for social, ecological, etc. And uh, uh, and uh, the transparent maps. 
in the beginning transparent maps were laid one over the other overlaid over the project location to produce a composite characterization of the environment and a shading system was used to indicate the degree of impacts and anyway it, it displays uh, spatial patterns but now it's easier overlays are we are uh, we, uh, we can make overlays very easily using the techniques of uh, uh, remote sensing and GIS, uh, geographical information systems. You, GIS is uh, quite useful in uh, overlay mapping for incorporating location information into an assessment. So it is uh, uh, with the development of uh, computational technique, it has become more effective. Then uh, this is uh, these are some superimposed maps. So this maps for different characteristics of the environment used to be placed to one hour or they used to be uh, plotted on transparent sheets and uh, used to used to be placed to one or the other to get a uh, comprehensive view of the impacts then uh, there are checklists checklists are specific comprehensive comprehensive list of environmental parameters to be investigated they may or may not include guidelines main advantage is as a structure and uh, the checklist can take several months. it can be a simple checklist or a descriptive checklist scaling weight scaling checklist and scaling weighting checklist as we have seen earlier the scaling weighting checklists are more useful as far as eia study is concerned by scaling we mean the magnitude of the impact or severity of the impact Eating, we consider the importance or significance so magnitude and importance of impact two aspects of simple checklist they are uh, questionnaire it's a it's a questionnaire checklist uh, and descriptive checklist this is a for a, a simple checklist for a bridge section project so it's a yes or no answer proposed project it's a, for a bridge construction project you can have a simple checklist like this then uh, scaling weighting checklist so uh, so we have already seen the importance uh, nominal groups now the most one of the most popular uh, scaling weighting checklist it is known as the Bethel Environmental Evaluation. It was uh, developed in the United States for uh, uh, water resources uh, projects. And uh, this system, uh, anyway, in the original system, there were 78 uh, predefined uh, decision factors or parameters. And the relative importance of these parameters has been commensurate units called parameter importance units or PIUs by quantifying several individual subjective value judgments some subjectivity is there and we generally consider a total of thousand PIUs were assigned to the parameters distributing the units to the four categories then to the 70 quantitative components you just see that so we consider four environmental components like ecology physical chemical aesthetic factors human interest and each parameter has its weight or environmental importance. So four components, 18 factors and total 78 parameters. So this 1000 uh, P, they are distributed among these 78 parameters. So this is a battle checklist for a battle event, ecology, physical, chemical, aesthetics, human interest. So many parameters under each category, under, under ecology, you have uh, terrestrial again, uh, terrestrial communities like that. It goes water quality, air quality, under physical chemical it comes. So many, so they are distributed. So it is based on socio psychological scaling techniques and a modified uh, Delphi procedure. And uh, we make use of uh, value function curves for the various parameters. And the objective measurements are presented into a subjective interval of environmental quality. One is for excellent environment quality and zero for poor environment. So we have a scale between zero and one. So this is uh, uh, this uh, function curves. You can have curves like this for each and every environmental parameters. Then, uh, and finally, 
earlier we talked about the parametric importance units and uh, this parametric importance unit is multi a factor called eq eq is a fraction between 0 and 1 and uh, the product of these two parameters will give rise an index called eiu or environmental impact units that is calculated and uh, that calculated and you find out the cumulative value eu so this eiu value is calculated for a situation without the project and with the project and we will come back. then the matrix method metric uh, matrix method is also very popular for uh, impact assessment it was developed by again developed by a scientist named scientist named the luna leopold uh, of the usa so it is usually called the leopold uh, interact interaction matrix it was the first uh, effort to relate the subcomponent activities to the subject subsequent environmental impacts so we use use uh, an open matrix actually an open matrix is used here you can see matrices and uh, you have uh, uh, different components and activities so on x axis you have you list out the actions and environmental items on y axis so you get cells so the cells are left open unless an impact between the act and the parameter is anticipated so if there is an impact you draw a you draw a diagonal line inside the matrix so it's a two dimensional checklist so in the original uh, leopold matrix about 100 developmental actions and 88 impact parameters were there so there are uh, for 8800 uh, possible interactions but in natural practice the number may be 25 to 50 and uh, the interaction is to be described in terms of magnitude and importance magnitude is and importance is significance here also we make use of a ranking scale from 0 to 10 again lot of subjectivity is involved so these are all it's a, you can you can even develop a three dimensional impact matrix then network methodologies are also there that these are networks which we consider the primary impacts and the secondary impacts due to a particular element of impact then so we have seen the different stages in a eia study starting from uh, collection of baseline verification of impacts prediction of impacts and finally assessment of impacts for assessment of impacts we have seen certain methodologies uh, like uh, the scaling weighting checklist the matrices then the overlay technique and all that then your summary of the eia report that is the eis environmental impact statement environmental impact statement should have a non technical summary we can it can give the summary it should it should have a uh, part 1 consisting of methods and key issues then background to the proposed project should be clearly explained then the topic the environmental impact assessment a summary of the assessment should be given then uh, so these are all contents of these are the contents of the eis now finally we have to consider the mitigation of impacts you should have an environmental management program and uh, as we have seen in the beginning we have to consider the construction phase aspiration phase so all these activities identification of impacts prediction of impacts evaluation of impacts all these activities are uh, carried out for construction as well as operation phase for as far as operation phase is concerned the mitigation measures include pollution prevention and control hazardous waste management environmental monitoring we usually focus on a green belt development Uh, planting lot of trees because uh, trees have a great role to play in environment protection so that also forms part of the mitigation plan so that so that is the summary of a eia report so i have tried to explain the different stages the methodology of environmental impact and uh, uh, and also the 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 importance of uh, various parameters in an eia study now finally uh anyway we don't have much time finally we will consider we will just uh, discuss the 
uh, the, the uh, legislative framework in our country. I have already uh, indicated about this uh, legislative uh, framework. I'll just uh, go to that. This uh, Indian legislation, uh, as uh, I have already explained, a notification on environmental impact assessment of developmental projects, it was issued in January 1994. So that was the beginning of EIA in our country, though it was uh, uh, adopted in the 1970s in the developed countries, we had to wait for long 24 years. Then in 1997, uh, the provision of public hearing, public participation was added. Then uh, 26, it had undergone uh, a thorough revision and it uh, superseded the 1994 notification. In the 2006 notification, the provision for state level impact assessment authority, delegation of powers to state level authorities was included for certain type of products. So this exercise is uh, uh, progressing in our country because now it is a mandatory requirement for most of the products. It's an efficient, effective tool. It has some uh, uh, disadvantages, but still it is uh, a, a tool for ensuring protection of the environment along with the developmental activity. So that's the importance of uh, yeah. Hope uh, uh, you could understand uh, the basics of uh, environmental impact uh, assessment. Uh, I take this opportunity to thank uh, all the participants uh, for their uh, patient hearing. And uh, if you have uh, any queries, uh, you may please feel to ask. Thank you very much. So now we can move on to doubt clearing session. The first question is, is there a scientific field studying life cycle assessment together with environmental impact assessment? Yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, these two techniques, anyway, life cycle assessment is also a technique which was developed in the 1970s and the 1980s in the, uh, in the Western world. Uh, you can, of course, think of clubbing them, but uh, life cycle assessment uh, is applicable mostly for a product. Okay, life cycle assessment focuses on the environmental impact of a pro of a product or service throughout its life cycle okay right from the selection of the raw material from the uh, from nature to the final disposal of the product here in eaa we focus more on a project or a policy or uh, a what we call a proposal so that way there is a difference but of course you can uh, uh, if if you are thinking of uh, making a product from that particular product, then of course, life cycle assessment can be combined with EA. Okay, hope I have uh, answered uh, your question. Okay. Thank you, sir. The next question is, how polluted soils can impact on human urban areas? Uh, so pollutants, pollutants can uh, affect our health in different ways. Uh, you know that uh, pollutants can be classified into different groups. You have air, water pollutants, then pollutants that uh, contaminate the soil, the groundwater and all that. So all these pollutants, if they a particular level or particular concentration, they will have impact on the uh, human health. And uh, the, the impact on human health, it may be either a short term or long term short term uh, impacts as well as long term impacts can be there. Suppose uh, we constantly get exposed to a polluted uh, environment, polluted air environment. Suppose we go on inhaling uh, a uh, hazardous uh, gases uh, like uh, sulfur dioxide or you continue to inhale a lot of dust. So over a period of time, it can lead to uh, acute uh, this respiratory problems. It can have lung diseases. Then uh, suppose you uh, you consume, for example, you consume uh, uh, groundwater containing uh, uh, higher concentration of pesticides. That can impact your health. 
over a period of time the impact may not be immediate but uh, over a long term it can have impact on your health it may lead to differences that uh, affects uh, that affect uh, human human organs so that way human health will get affected okay thank you sir the next question is what do you think about stack rapids and filtration used in developing world uh, it's not clear to me uh, it is uh, can you just repeat the question of course sir what do you think about stack rapids and filtrations used in developing world oh uh, uh, it is uh, rapid sand filtration isn't it sand uh, rapid yes. sand filtration no okay. so rapid sand filtration it's an effective tool so you know, that uh, filtration you have uh, slow slow sand filtration rapid sand filtration and uh, pressure sand filtration different types are there. so in a developing country in a developing uh, country like ours uh, rapid sand filters can be very effectively used for uh, decontaminating water in uh, water treatment plants we can have uh, rapid sand filters usually rapid sand filters are installed after the sedimentation tank in a water treatment plant rapid sand filters follow the sedimentation tank so the the suspended solid suspended solids and to some extent uh, the dissolved solids present in water can be removed effectively with the help of these uh, rapid sand filters consisting of uh, different uh, layers of uh, sand gravel etc so it's a useful tool even uh, these rapid sand filters are found to be effective for the removal of pathogenic microorganisms also they can uh, remove because uh, it acts as a filter bed and uh, Uh, pathogenic organisms like a uh, bacteria uh, uh, can be effectively removed in the filter so that way it is uh, highly beneficial for uh, developing countries okay thank you sir the next question is is there any flaws in gadgil report uh, is there any flaws in gadgil reports yeah. Gadgil report okay. <laughs> okay so this uh, it is a a uh, controversial uh, issue anyway this uh, god gil first of all we have to admit that uh, the report submitted by professor madhav god gil the committee headed by madhav god gil on the uh, what we call the environmental uh, preservation of the western ghats it was a uh, it was a bold step it was a comprehensive report there is no doubt about it uh, but uh, five, but only problem was that uh, uh we human human beings we started occupying many areas because uh, anyway uh, when the population went up we had to uh, we had to uh, uh, occupy forest land in earlier days uh, there were uh, not many legislations uh, for uh, in those states uh, human beings they started occupying the forest area started cultivation and that way they contributed to development of the area but uh, he has pointed out that these developmental activities developmental activities without any concern for the environment has affected the western ghats to a great extent so he has suggested certain mitigating measures so for example there are anyway we can call it a flow but uh, the problem is already uh, people are living there a large population is living in those areas and uh, it is very difficult to uh, displace those people we cannot uh, ask them to leave that area all on a sudden it's not possible at least we can think of we can think of stopping further developmental areas uh, developmental work in those sensitive areas that way the uh, madhav gadgil report is significant after the madhav gadgil report uh, uh this uh, kasturi rangan committee report was also made i think some of them and uh, that committee was appointed in view of the concerns expressed by the population which occupies this uh, western ghats uh, region so their concerns were addressed in uh, 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 this kasturi uh, rangan committee report so but anyway i i will not say that there were uh, flaws in the gargil committee report it is a very comprehensive report if you go through the report you can see that they have carried out a uh, 
uh, scientific study on the impacts of development on the climate. Okay. Thank you, sir. The next question is: Is there any software to develop mathematical models for impact prediction? If uh, a number of such uh, commercial softwares are available, uh, the uh, U.S. Environment Protection Agency, that is the Environmental Enforcement Agency in the U.S., they were the pioneers in developing these softwares. Uh, for example, uh, uh, softwares like uh, Industrial Source Complex Short Time Model (ISCST). It was a uh, software. developed by us epa for uh, impact on air quality mathematical models it's a uh, mathematics software uh, based on uh, gaussian tube dispersion model that particular software is uh, very popular and it's further modification for example different various countries have developed such for example uh, softwares for example australian environmental agency they have a software called osplume like that uh, several commercial softwares are available in the market they are based on mathematical models uh, similarly there are uh, models for uh, uh, what we call uh, air quality uh, so water quality prediction based on uh, this uh, dissolved oxygen sac model such softwares are also available okay hope we have covered all the relevant questions within the time limit thank you so much sir We would like to express our sincere gratitude to Professor Madhu Sir for taking such an excellent webinar. Thank you all for your participation. We will be back with our next webinar on 6th June 2020. Follow up our webinar series and let's learn together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.